Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand for our call to worship? This is the word of the Lord from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please join us as we sing this morning. Oh, praise the name. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus lived and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Drenched in tears, they laid him down in justice to the entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. seated. Good morning. 
Welcome to Linkroft Bible Church here at LBC. We are transformed by the gospel to be rooted in Christ, connected in community, and engaged in mission. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here. We're very glad that you're with us this morning and tuning in as well to worship with us. One of the things that we prioritize is preaching Christ from all of Scripture because we believe that the gospel transforms everything. And the next couple of weeks, we're covering a series in Philemon, a small book, which you'll hear more about later. But the focus of this book is gospel transformation. We want to lift up Jesus and the salvation and power that he brings to, to save us from our sins and grow us in our faith. We hope that this service can be a gift which is given back to you. So if this is your first time here, don't feel pressured to give, uh, but receive this as a gift of worship uh, to the Lord that you can uh, receive. But if you are a member of this church, we ask that you would give and give generously. There's a giving plate in the back uh, that you can drop your checks off or cash off with, or you can give online as well. Uh, I do want to highlight a couple of important dates that are coming up. In two weeks, on September 20th, we are having our annual Resolve service. Resolve is our annual uh, uh, kind of vision Sunday for the year, laying out where God has been leading us and what the focus and direction of the church will be over the next year. And so this will be happening on Sunday morning uh, out here on the lawn. We will be... Uh, modifying our our morning service not too significantly but we will be sharing with you uh, where God has been leading us as pastors and elders uh, for the year and also we will have some other uh, things attached to that some special things uh, for that Sunday as well there'll be some resources and more information is is coming uh, this week about that as well another big date uh, to keep in mind is October 4th uh, we are planning to move back inside uh, for worship on that Sunday. Um, so that's where we're really excited about that um, and on that Sunday. Now, the difficulty of uh, making a plan uh, to move back inside is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a wide variety of opinions um, and comfort levels. And so uh, you may have noticed that we sent out a survey around um, to fill out and, and get some feedback there. And from within our body of people who have uh, joined us in membership, they love Jesus and they are uh, growing in their faith. There's a wide perspective. I saw some responses of saying uh, people don't want to wear masks inside to people saying, uh, I probably won't be coming unless everyone is uh, diligently wearing their masks. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, the difficulty of this is that uh, no matter what plan that we go with, we probably uh, will end up excluding some part of the LBC family. And that is just a reality, um, but that's not our intention to do that. Our intention is to follow God's lead. And really, uh, you may notice as well that sometimes uh, the plans and information from the church rolls out kind of slow. And that's by virtue of how we're set up and that we operate as a team of elders, a team of pastors, and that, you know, I may have my preferences, but I can't just go off and make a decision on my own. It's in collaboration with the, the shepherds that God has installed here at the church. So we just make decisions sort of slowly uh, because we come to consensus and we work through those things together as a team to discern God's leading for us. Uh, as a church, for, and oftentimes, even as pastors and elders, surprise, surprise, we don't always agree. I'm actually working uh, on a small uh, theological issue with another elder, and we come down on different sides of this issue, but it's been a great working relationship because we're working together out of shared love for Jesus to help uh, shepherd the church forward on this theological issue. It's not related to any of this regathering stuff. Uh, but that's how, how we operate here. And so sometimes decisions come down uh, more slowly because of that. Um, but we are intending to uh, move back inside and we are intending to focus more on what we will get from this, that we get to worship the Lord. And we don't want to forget that. We don't want to forget why we gather in the first place, which is to worship and also to live as family. And so as pastors, we are trying to discern all of the relevant factors uh, in these decisions. Obviously, health 
uh, is an important factor, but it's not the only factor in that there are, we long for the spiritual health, emotional, mental health of our congregation as well. So putting all these things together takes time, thought, deliberation, and most of all, wisdom. And I was humbled this week as I was reading in Job. Uh, Job 28.20 says that where can wisdom be found? It is not found with any living creature, but it's found in God alone. And so that is my hope that I can submit myself to God's wisdom. And as pastors and elders, we submit ourselves to God's wisdom. So the 20th is resolved. Moving back inside is the 4th. And also uh, there's a men's retreat coming up in October. And so if you have questions about that, you can reach out to Costa. Costa, where are you at? Can I get a hand? Right there. He can give you all the details. But if you are a man, you can find a registration form online. Fill that out, and then you will be redirected to the camp, uh, the, the retreat center's website for payment and actual uh, register, registration through them. All you need to do when you fill out that registration through the, the retreat center is make sure, I think it's on like the third or fourth page, you put in three little letters, L, B, C. And that will let you know, uh, that will let the camp know that you are with our group. All right. But again, if you have any questions, you can see Costa. You can fill you in with all the details out there and you can find that on the uh, on the website. But now let us turn our time to the Lord in prayer. Hear this call of confession from Galatians chapter three. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today asking for your grace and mercy to forgive us because we have not been attentive to the tutor that you have given us to your law. We have ignored your word with its call to love and consideration of others. We have turned our back on the calls to make sure that we're devoting our time to being with you in your word and in prayer. And so we ask, Lord, that you may forgive us. We do ask, Lord, that you might forgive us of not leaving our tutor, because as your word said, the tutor of the law was in place for a time, but its function was to lead us to Christ. And so often we get wrapped up in the old way of the tutor, the old way of law, thinking that through our efforts, we can earn righteousness before you, that through our good deeds, you will be more accepting of us. And so we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us from being tied to the law and not coming to Christ. And Lord, when we come to Christ, we realize that we are not God that we are fallible, finite, and weak creatures in desperately in need of your grace. And we know that he is our only hope. He is the only one who can save us, has saved us, and is the only one who can continue to change us, continue to remove the deep entrenched sins in our life so that we may walk in holiness and righteousness. And so, Lord, we ask that we may have a deeper understanding of what it means to be justified, what it means to be declared to be in the right, not because of our works, but because of Jesus's death for our sin and his victorious resurrection. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this assurance of pardon. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Would you please stand with us as we continue to worship through song? <clears throat> Yet I look for one 
this on? Yeah. Are you Talk. sure, Rob? Talk closer to it. Talk closer. I really miss you guys. I really have. It's good to be back. We're going to be reading from uh, Philemon. Uh, Philemon, the, uh, the whole book. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apifia, our sister, and Acrippus, our so fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for the, all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he may serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but that of your own accord. For this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge to my account. I, Paul, write this in my own hand. I, I will repay it to say nothing of you owing me everything, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark and two other guys and Luke, my fellow workers, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit. Let's, uh, let's pray. 
Father God, we just, just thank you and praise you for opportunities for us to gather together in a difficult and uh, strange time, Lord. Lord, even though it seems like things around us are shaken, things around us are, are broken, Lord, you sit firmly on your throne. You are in complete control. Nothing surprises you. Nothing has come here without you knowing, Lord. Lord, we thank you for being our God, for being the, the cornerstone on which this church is built. We thank you for the love that you have for us. And we thank you that we have the ability to gather here, even though it's outside, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for it. Lord, we thank you that we can come before you with our prayers. And we thank you that you answer those prayers and for the gift of answered prayers. Lord, I think of this body here that you are knitting together. And I think of just the many ways that you have answered the prayers through this pandemic. Lord, I, I think I just want to thank you so much for being with the Blanton family this week, for being with Elisha as, as we see healing in him and just the possibility that he may come home, Lord. We just know these are all gifts from you. We thank you for it. We thank you for his birth. We thank you for the just the life that you've given to the Blantons there. Lord, we also just thank you in the many ways that you have protected this congregation from, from this uh, virus, from what you uh, what could possibly be, Lord, you have in your graciousness have protected us from it. We thank you for it. We pray for your uh, wisdom. We pray for your guidance as we move forward as a congregation. Lord, looking forward to going back indoors. We, we just want to be obedient both to you and to the government that's over us, Lord. We just pray again that you guide us. With your spirit, you show us exactly what you want us to do. Not running ahead, not lagging behind, but Lord, just staying in step with you. We pray for uh, this new season that's upon us. I think of this fall. I think of the, the many schools starting up in just a different realm that it's in, Lord. I pray for the mission house as uh, the, the guys have moved back in and their ministry begins here, Lord. I just pray that as this new season is upon us, that you continue to bless us, you continue to guide us, and that we continue to listen to your leading, Lord. Lord, now today, as uh, Dan comes to give us your word, we just pray that you guide him, use him as in a mighty way. I pray that you bless us here today with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you, all right. Learned a couple of things during a pandemic. One is that a lot of people have motorcycles. Did you know that? I don't know. I don't know if you noticed, but sometimes motorcycles drive by when we're out here, and uh, it can be hard to hear. So I didn't know so many people. Do any anybody have a motorcycle here? We're not really. That doesn't really kind of mark us as a culture. Another thing is that uh, I'm not used to speaking in front of a camera, so we have to put this hula hoop up here. And I'm not going to demonstrate for that. Maybe Micah can show you how to do that, or, or you kids can, can play with the hula hoop uh, afterwards. Um, another thing that's interesting is uh, greeting one another, right? It, that can be awkward. Are we doing the handshake? Are we not touching? What, what are we doing, right? Everyone has experienced this. Awkward situations are pretty common. Some people, uh, or most people, I think, try to avoid awkward situations. I think that God has uniquely gifted me to create awkward situations for people, and most of you are uh, experiencing that right now. Some people, like uh, Dave, thrive in awkward situations. In fact, they actually get sick pleasure out of making people feel awkward. Uh, but most of us try to avoid awkward situations. I remember being a kid uh, and uh, playing at some friend's house. And one of the most awkward things that could happen is uh, you are at some other family's house and they start having a family argument. Have you ever been in that experience? The other family is fighting and you're like, this is, I am not comfortable right now. Uh, this is, uh, you know, my family, like we didn't really fight. The most you ever got there was a raised voice, uh, especially between my parents. Um, and, uh, and so being in that sort of experience is really awkward. Um, or another time I remember driving in the car uh, with somebody on the way to practice and like this guy uh, was one of my teammates. He was not treating his mom well. And she's like, why can't you just be more like Dan? Man, I could not get out of that car fast enough. Apparently it was unfazed him because I think he knew in no way did he want to be like me. Um, 
but these are uncomfortable situations. We've all experienced things that were awkward. And I have to imagine that this was a, a bit of an awkward letter for Onesimus, the uh, returning slave going back to his master as he listened to the letter written to Philemon and the church that met in his house, a letter that he had to hand deliver, a letter that was going to be read publicly, and a letter that concerned him and how the church was supposed to treat him. If you remember last week, Chris set the context of this letter. It's a letter about an escaped slave named Onesimus who escaped from his master Philemon, but on the way somewhere encountered the apostle Paul, but more importantly encountered Jesus Christ and his power to save him. He put his trust in Christ, repenting of his sins, and he became a new man. But after being discipled by the Apostle Paul for a while, uh, Paul sent him back, despite the fact that he had proven quite useful to Paul, he sent him back to Philemon in order that he might be restored. And Chris explained last week that though this is a letter about a man named Philemon, his former slave Onesimus, and the church that met in his house, it is really more than all else, it's a letter about gospel transformation. It's about the power of the gospel to change us from the inside out and not just change us as individuals, but change communities and uh, cities. As such, it's a story, not just with some principles, but it gives us insight into our own lives as well. So Philemon as a letter is a family letter about a family matter, but it's read publicly and preserved through the centuries by God's providence to teach us something about gospel transformation. And so since that's our purpose as a church, this letter should be of significant interest to us. Last week, Chris did a quick pass through the letter, looking at this letter through the perspective of Philemon and showed how the gospel changes us from the inside out. And he explained how the gospel is a message about Jesus, his kingship, his cross, and how through his grace, we can have a, a new life, a, a new relationship with God himself. The gospel is good news that in Christ, God is making all things new, including you and me. But new isn't always comfortable, right? Sometimes new things, maybe going to a new school, uh, moving to a new neighborhood, these things stretch us and make us uncomfortable in ways. But for the most part, new things are good for us because they challenge us to grow. And in this letter, uh, we see three aspects of newness that the gospel brings as it is unfolded in Onesimus's life. And so our big idea for this morning is very simply this. The gospel makes us new, and we'll see three aspects of that newness. Onesimus experienced the newness of gospel transformation in unexpected ways, and we can expect the gospel to transform us too. The first way that we see newness in this letter is that the gospel gives us a new identity, a new identity. I know when I was a kid, um, probably about uh, 10 or 11 years old, the most important thing in my life was the New York Giants. Now it's pretty high up there, but uh, not quite at that level. And when I was a kid, that was probably, if you said, who are you? I would say, I'm a Giants fan. And uh, my dad and I had the privilege of going to a lot of the Giants games growing up. And uh, I proved my identity as a Giants fan well by how much uh, Giants garb I wore. I, I had to head to foot, inside, outside, pretty much everything that could be a piece of clothing was a New York Giants piece of clothing. I was a Giants fan. Now, while I don't identify primarily that way anymore, we all identify ourselves in certain ways. As humans, we find all kinds of different sources of identity. Uh, as people, we introduce ourselves often on the basis of what we do. We say, hi, my name is Dan and I'm a pastor, or my name is Joe and I'm a, an accountant. We define ourselves often by what we do. I wonder if you noticed how the Apostle Paul introduces himself in this letter. In verse 1, we see that Paul says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Now, that's interesting because in almost every letter that Paul writes, he introduces himself by describing that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. In other words, in most of the letters that Paul is writing, he is writing and establishing his credibility to bring God's word to bear in that church's life by saying that he is an apostle. An apostle is in a pretty esteemed position. There's only 12 of them. Uh, who encountered the risen Christ in a particular way, and so they had uh, authority to speak on behalf of God. But in this letter, Paul makes no mention of his apostleship, at least explicitly, and he defines himself, in fact, goes to great lengths to define himself, particularly as a prisoner 
for Christ Jesus. Three times in this short letter, he describes himself that way or identifies himself that way. So we have to ask the question, then, why is that? Well, first of all, Paul isn't just acknowledging that he's in jail for preaching Jesus, but it seems to indicate that his captivity or bondage isn't merely to the Roman authorities, but it's actually to Jesus. And in the context of a letter to a slave owner about a former slave, Paul identifying with someone in captivity or in bondage is pretty important. Paul reminds Philemon as he writes this letter that all of us, spiritually speaking, are slaves. We are either slaves to sin or we are slaves to God. You see, before Christ, the condition that the scripture tells us we find ourselves in is enslaved to sin. Romans 3 teaches this. Ephesians 2 teaches this. But in embracing the gospel, God frees you from the prison of sin, but he takes you captive to something much greater, and that is grace. That's why some Christians call God's saving grace irresistible or overcoming grace. It's so powerful that it, in a sense, arrests your soul and takes you captive to a far greater master. Paul describes it this way in Romans chapter 6. He says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, meaning you didn't have to obey God. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, i.e., if you live for yourself, you die apart from God. But listen, he says, But you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. And the fruit you get is sanctification, which leads to eternal life. So Paul says, before I was a slave living for myself, but God saved me and in a sense enslaved me to grace. And so know this, every one of us is serving something. We will always serve something or someone. It's in our nature. But the Bible tells us that the freest way to live is to live to serve God, to live as a prisoner of grace. And so Paul starts this letter with one line describing how the gospel has changed his identity, and he writes to persuade Philemon about Onesimus' identity. Notice how he describes that identity change in verse 10 and 11. He says, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Paul calls Onesimus his child, and he identifies himself as his father. Paul is affirming a change in Onesimus' identity. He's a new man. Not only has he become Paul's spiritual son, but more importantly, he's become God's son. God has transformed his identity from a fugitive slave to a faultless son. And apparently, Paul is so convinced of God's transforming work in his life that Paul sees fit to adopt Onesimus as if he were his own child. The scriptures teach in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. To become a Christian is to have a transformed identity. It's to become an entirely new person. And while that may be hard on one level to accept about ourselves, it can be even harder to accept that about somebody else, particularly someone who has a a past that we might not want to reckon with. But Paul believes so deeply in the power of the gospel to transform because that's what he experienced himself. Remember, I think sometimes we forget about this, about the Apostle Paul. He was a religious terrorist. He persecuted people of faith, but God arrested him in his grace and gave him a new identity. And so Paul understands deeply the power of the gospel to change who he was. And because of that, Paul now can look at this man Onesimus a runaway slave, and treat him as a child of God. You know, many people think that their past disqualifies them for a future with God, or even that if they come to Jesus, they still have to define themselves by their past failures, by their past shames or past shortcomings. But God doesn't view us that way. And what Onesimus experienced in his relationship with Paul was a tangible expression of God's love for him in Christ. You see, we can believe intellectually or accept Uh, by way of our minds, the doctrine of sonship, but it's a totally different thing when we experience it in relationships with others. Paul made tangible for Onesimus the fatherly love of God in Christ. 
The way Paul treated Onesimus was the way God had treated him. And Paul brings that to bear in the way that he treats his newfound son. So think about the difference then that this makes as you go back to deliver this letter. Onesimus has no idea how Philemon will respond. Onesimus is completely vulnerable. He could become captive again as a slave. Philemon could harden his heart. The church could reject him. But as Onesimus hears this read, I have to think that a smile comes to his face. As he hears the line, as, as he hears this line, because as bad as it could get for him, he knows his dad loves him. He could reason, Philemon might reject me, this church might reject me, but I know my dad loves me. And nothing can make Papa Paul stop loving me. Paul knows who I am, but even more, what he's experienced from Papa Paul, he's experienced from his Abba Father. And nothing can stop God's love for you in Christ. So maybe you're a little bit like Onesimus and you've been running away. I don't know what you're running from, but you're trying to escape perhaps your former life, your past, or the fact that you cannot escape the consequences of your sin. The fact is, though, you cannot escape the, the, the righteous judgment of God toward you unless you are arrested by grace. And so I would appeal to you this morning, if you're outside of Christ, if you're running away from God, that you stop running away from God and you turn yourself over to him. There's a new life waiting for you. And just like someone who gets placed in the witness protection program, gets placed in a new home with a new identity and new documents, so it is for us in Christ. We get placed into a new family and are given a totally new identity. And that identity is called a child of God. And so, friend, this morning, if you've come to Christ, your worth and value isn't in who you think you are, nor is it in who you feel yourself to be. You are who God says you are. And in Christ, you're his beloved son. One of the things that I learned from the man who discipled me was that the most important thing in life isn't who you were, but it's who you are in Christ and who you're becoming in Christ. And here's where I think the burden of Christian discipleship comes, whether as a parent toward your children or whether in the church, what we need to be able to do for one another is remind one another like spiritual parents of who we are in Christ and who we're becoming in Christ. As a church, we need lots of spiritual moms and dads who can teach the children, so to speak, in this church about who we really are in Christ. So the gospel makes us new. It transforms us, giving us a new identity. But the gospel also gives us a new purpose. The gospel gives us a new purpose, and that's the ex second expression of newness we see in Onesimus's life. We see that in verses 11 to 13. Paul writes to Philemon about Onesimus. Formerly, he was useless to you. Maybe you've said that of someone, your children. Because they're not doing something, you're useless to me. And we mean it as a joke. But Paul's serious. Formerly he was useless to you. But now he indeed is useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very own heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. You know, Emily and I named each of our kids something very specific. I think all of us name our kids, but I, we named our kids... Uh, with, with names that have meanings because we hope that our kids will live into the meaning of those names. Apparently Onesimus was not living into the meaning of his name because the name Onesimus means useful. And apparently as a slave, he was quite useless. Now we don't know why he was useless. Perhaps it was because he was lazy. Maybe he was just incompetent, but he was useless to his master. And it's not an understatement to say that of Onesimus that he didn't like his former life. He did not like his job or his master. But when he met Jesus, everything changed. Because when he met Jesus, he found a new master with a new purpose that brought a new joy. It changed everything, and he was no longer useless, but he became useful. Not just for Philemon, but also for Paul. And I think we can infer to God himself and God's purposes. Today, modern people tend to measure their worth based on what we can produce or based on our perceived usefulness to others. We think I'm the sum of what I may create or produce. And that's why people many times pour their entire lives into their work, even to the neglect of God or family. People find not just their identity, but also their sense of purpose and value from what they're able to do. Now, not everybody that is that way. Sometimes younger generations in resistance to becoming that way uh, work so hard to define themselves not on the basis of what they do, that they do virtually nothing and are also useless. 
And so overwork and underwork, neither of those things produce the kind of life that is useful to God and his purposes. Both ways of living are profoundly unsatisfying because both ways of living are profoundly selfish. Whether you live for your work or you live not to work, both the forms are living for yourself. In other words, you're a slave to your own desires. And so whether you live for yourself, you are useless for the good of others. And if you live on a treadmill of performance, pursuing success, or whether you flow in on a lazy river of self-satisfaction, both are endless and both lead to nowhere. But you see, the Christian views their life differently because they believe that their worth is not found in inherent usefulness, but in Christ. Christians acknowledge that it is sin that makes us useless. Before Christ, before we came to Christ, that is, we were useless to God and to others because we were slaves to sin and to self. But Jesus transforms us, gives us a new purpose, and makes us useful to God and to others. Through the cross, Jesus frees us from our need to serve ourselves, to give us dignity, worth, and value. And in Christ, he gives us all the dignity, worth, and value we could ever hope or long for. And so like many of us, I'm sure that Onesimus, as he was a slave laboring for a boss that he didn't like, just wanted to be free from that burden. He thought, if I could just get out of this situation, everything will be good in my life. Maybe you've thought that way. Maybe you think that way right now. But getting free from that burden didn't actually free Onesimus because once he was free, he found that he really wasn't free because there was a more significant bondage than that of his job. And the more significant bondage was his own sin. So as much as he tried to cast off the restraints that were around him, he still found that he could not escape his sin. Maybe you're not that different from Onesimus. Maybe you've been trying to find your value and worth in something else. Maybe all you can think and dream about is a better job, a better house, or a better spouse. But have you considered that perhaps if you got that thing, you might not just be as free or happy as you thought you would be? Here's what I find most fascinating, I think, about Onesimus. Once he believes the gospel and begins to experience the kind of deep heart change that Jesus brings, suddenly he begins to think differently about serving. Remember, before he was a slave, what do slaves do? They serve. He just wanted to get out of that life. But once he meets Jesus, did you notice what he starts to do? He starts to serve. He serves Paul, apparently with such a level of devotion and competence that Paul finds him useful, nearly not wanting to send him back. That's either powerful transformation or it's brainwashing at the level of the absurd. In other words, before Onesimus had to serve. But now in Christ, he finds himself glad to serve. Before Christ, he served begrudgingly because he was trapped serving a master he cared nothing for. But when he encountered Jesus, he realized that there was a higher master to whom he gave account. And that master was King Jesus, a good and gracious master who had served him. You see, the gospel is a message not about just a king who sits high in the heavens. He is that king. But that king who sits high in heaven has come down to earth and he has served us. Jesus says of himself that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so when we take up the cross and believe that message, we too become servants. But we become servants of a king who serves. We get a new identity with a new purpose. Onesimus came to see that in the kingdom of God, what makes you useful is not how much you can produce, but how freely you can serve King Jesus by serving others. And so it changes your outlook entirely, particularly one of the things that changes your outlook about is your work. Most of you are going to go back to work tomorrow, or you'll go back to a computer and work online. Sorry to have to remind you about that. You were like, it was a good day until now. Actually, no, tomorrow you don't have to go back to work. They're like, does he even know what day it is? It's Labor Day weekend, people. Tomorrow is a day off. But on Tuesday, you will have to go back to work, and that will be worse. But here's a question for you. As a Christian, how do you think about your work? Is it a means to an end? Is it a necessary evil? Or is it service to King Jesus for the good of others? You see, Christian, God made you to work. But Christian work is different. Now, Christian work isn't just vocational ministry. It's not just what pastors and missionaries do. All Christians who work can say that they do Christian work. But what makes work distinctly Christian? I mean, is there a Christian way to crunch numbers or a Christian way to, to lay bricks? I mean, 
Christians and non-Christians do those jobs the same way, right? Well, really, Christian work is about your motive and your mindset. Paul tells the Colossian believers, another letter that Onesimus would have hand delivered, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your might as working to the Lord and not to men. You see, as Christians, we acknowledge that we serve a greater boss than our earthly boss. We serve a king named Jesus who owns it all and who is in charge of it all. And all work from sewage cleanup to the entrepreneurial startup to the CEO all the way up, all work that is done to the Lord and not to men is an act of service to God. It's about your heart and it's about the intent of your work. And the only way to change your heart is to believe the gospel more fully. And the only way to believe the gospel more fully is to stare at Christ more deeply. And as we behold Christ in his word, and as we come to love and treasure King Jesus, our heart begins to change and our work begins to look differently. And so it's fair to say then that when the gospel goes to work in you, it reshapes how you work. You go to work not as a slave to work, but as a slave to God who is free to serve. So whether you work outside of the home or inside of the home, whether you're blue collar, white collar, or no collar, you, like Onesimus, have a new purpose, and that new purpose is to serve King Jesus in and through your work. The gospel transforms us, giving us a new identity. It also gives us a new purpose, and the last newness that we see experienced in Onesimus' life is that we get a new family. It's been pointed out to me recently that apparently I have a profound capacity because I have children to just tune out noise. And so people will be talking to me. I have no idea that they're talking to me. And usually it's intentional. I'm not paying attention on purpose. But I have a way of tuning out noise. But, but some of you who've experienced this ability have also likely uh, heard that you, you still are sort of hearing things. And there's certain things that sometimes are said in the context of the noise that make you raise your eyebrows and your ears perk up. Did he really just say that? You know, it's pretty funny when that happens when you're preaching. You can totally tell. People aren't paying attention. Then you say something maybe a little bit borderline offensive. And people are like, what? Did he pat? Did, did, did that happen? Well, I think it, I imagine this is not biblical authority here. But I imagine that as this letter is being read, that when Paul get or when the letter reader gets to verse 15 and 16, it's an eyebrow raising moment. People's ears perk up because they're wondering, did he really just say that? What is that that he's talking about? Perhaps it says in verse 15, this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, a beloved brother. Especially to me, but much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What? No longer as a bondservant, no longer as a slave, but as a brother, both in the flesh and in the Lord. This is not just an eyebrow raising moment. This is a paradigm shifting moment. Paul's taking personal transformation to an uncomfortable level of public implication. This man is not just to be thought of as a slave or even as a former slave, but as a brother. And it's not just to be thought of that way as indicated by in the Lord. This is not just in a spiritual sense that he's speaking, but he's to be treated that way physically in the community of believers indicated by the expression also in the flesh. This was shocking in the Greco-Roman world where a lot of scholars estimate that up to 30 to 40 percent of people were enslaved in some way, indentured or otherwise. Slavery or bond servanthood was part of the social structure of the day. But Paul raises eyebrows and makes ears twitch and people shift uncomfortably in the seat because he is describing radical, subversive, deeply personal change that impacts the entire community of faith. You see, in Jesus, God is making a new family and he's making that family from among all people. And what that means is that in Christ, all of us check our cultural identifiers at the door. We all enter the family into the same way, that is, as equals. Equally condemned by our sin, but equally saved and accepted by Jesus' grace. And that coming to us by faith alone. You see, the crazy thing about this new family is that in Christ, both slave and slave owner can become brothers. The gospel reorients and totally relativizes social status and cultural qualifiers. Listen to what Paul tells the Galatian believers in Galatians 3. He says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. 
There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Did you notice that? We are all one. In other words, cultural qualifiers are relativized in Jesus. But it's not merely enough to acknowledge this as a spiritual reality. It has to be acted on. And despite the fact that many Christians know this and affirm this to be true, the biggest gap in life is the gap between knowing and doing. We know that to be true. We know lots of things that God says to do, but we have a hard time doing it. And what Paul is describing here is something that he intends not just to be assented to mentally or spiritually, but to be acted on in reality. And so I want you to picture this scene. The letter finishes. It didn't take very long to read, but there stands Onesimus, Philemon, and the rest of the church. I have to imagine it was silent for a while, an awkward and long silence. Onesimus has made himself totally vulnerable coming back, willing to accept whatever penalty comes his way. Philemon has lost a lot personally and economically. The church is full of people who also likely owned slaves of their own and so would naturally side with Philemon. They're only standing a few feet apart from one another, but experientially they're worlds apart. And so what will they do? Will they reconcile? Will Philemon give Onesimus a big hug and say, welcome home, brother? Will the church follow suit and accept him as a brother? Will they be able to cross the social and cultural divides of their past differences? We don't know. The letter doesn't tell us, and there's nothing else in Scripture that gives us information about this. Frankly, as a reader of Scripture, I find that a bit unsatisfying, don't you? Don't you want to know what happened? How does this story end? But you know what? I think that God knows what he's doing. That's an understatement. I think it very intentionally ends the letter this way with a sort of silent cliffhanger, much like the story of the prodigal son where the older brother is standing outside and his listeners were left wondering, what will he do? But the most important question is not what will he do, but what will we do? You see, the response to the letter resides with us. We are this church reading this letter, overhearing this conversation. We have to do something with this story. And this story shows us something about ourselves and forces us to ask the question, can we treat the slave as our brother? Will we cross the social and cultural divide? Can we overcome our differences in our past and love each other like family? We don't know the answer as to what happened then, but we know the answer to how it can happen now. The only way that people as different as Philemon and Onesimus can call each other brothers is if the gospel really transforms our hearts. You see, the gospel is a message about a cross where a Savior died. And it is a cross that bridges the divide between our differences and our past. You see, the cross of Jesus shows us that God himself bridged the divide between himself and us. And no one is more different than God and us. No gap is greater than the divide between the holy and infinite, divinely perfect, glorious king of the universe and his broken, rebellious creatures. But the cross proves that there is no barrier or divide too great to move across in love. And if Christ did that for us, we must reason this. If Christ did that for us while we were his enemies, then certainly people like Philemon and Onesimus and the church can become family. There's no distance too great between us that the cross cannot connect us. You know, sometimes people read this letter and they wonder, you know, if slavery is so evil and morally wrong, why doesn't Paul just take this opportunity to condemn it? His response, if you're looking for that, seems underwhelming. Why isn't he outraged and calling for public advocacy and tearing down statues of Caesar? And in a culture today that runs on outrage, this may seem like an underwhelming approach. But while it may not answer all of our questions, nor is it trying to, I think that it does demonstrate that the way that change happens is that it begins on the personal level and it works its way outward. You see, after all, instead of asking why doesn't he condemn slavery, we should ask, 
how in this atmosphere of gospel-shaped love could slavery continue to exist? I think this is what's going on here. Paul is so convinced of the power of the gospel to change hearts that he doesn't need to condemn it because he trusts the power of the gospel at work to undermine it. Just like he appeals, not out of, by way of command, but out of love, so we see this here. Paul doesn't call here for tearing down structures and systems. Now, while there may be space and place for Christians to do that in terms of public advocacy, that's not the point of this letter. What Paul does call for is tearing down the dividing walls of hostility between family members. He also does this in Ephesians chapter 2, saying that it is the gospel that tears down the dividing wall of hostility between us. And then think about if this is embraced, the kind of change that would work its way out. As Jesus says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so if Philemon starts to change and calls this former slave a brother, and the church follows his example, what does that begin to look like in the community? How are they viewed? What opportunities for preaching the gospel are there when the gospel is actually being lived out? Albeit slow and ordinary, the results of that can be extraordinary. So how do we reckon with a letter like this? Well, I think one question we ought to ask ourselves this morning is what kind of qualifiers might keep you from calling someone family? What, what sort of past, what sort of preference, what sort of opinion might keep you from embracing someone as a brother or as a sister? One of the things that I find profoundly frustrating right now in our time and place is that more and more people want to identify each other by what camp they find themselves in. But as the people of God, shouldn't we consistently find ourselves outside of the camp where Jesus is? Shouldn't we find that there are no significant or sufficient cultural qualifiers to identify us ourselves? Because if we're shaped by anything, we're shaped by a cross and nothing in the culture can be described that way. And so if we are people shaped by the gospel, we shouldn't really fit into any categories perfectly because the cross confounds the wisdom of the world. Perhaps the most pressing challenge we face as a church moving forward is that we would unite around the gospel and not define ourselves primarily by cultural markers. We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all who is over all and in all and through all. Still, we may be tempted to write one another off based on secondary or tertiary convictions or, or matters of expression of wisdom. But if we write one another off because of cultural, racial, political, or generational differences, wouldn't you agree that we write off our witness to the world? But if we move toward one another, as God has moved toward us in Christ, think about the impact. Think about what that does in Monmouth County and beyond. If we're willing to bear with one another, both in our failings and in our successes, and to bear one another's burdens. What's more compelling to the world than a community that has unity that cannot be explained? What's more compelling than a community that's multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-social, multi-convictional, multi multi-anything, multi and yet united in their common love for Jesus and one another? It's okay that we disagree about things. Don't forget that Jews and Gentiles disagreed about far more than we did in the early church. And yet it was the gospel that united them. They shared life together because they agreed about the two most important things, that we are both great sinners and we both need a great savior. That's our fixed point. As we move forward, that's what brings us together. And that is the lens through which we ought to view all else. Onesimus experienced the transforming power of the gospel. I don't know how the rest of the church heard this letter and consider that more next week. But what I do long for is that as we consider this reality of gospel transformation, which is our purpose, that we would be more rooted in Christ, knowing we have a new identity. We're sons and daughters of God. That we would be more connected in community because we have a new family. And that we would be more engaged in mission because we have a new purpose. Onesimus experienced the power of the gospel. I pray that we will as well. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you because you first loved us and you sent your son to be the savior of the world. We humbly acknowledge that we are great sinners and we are in need of your great salvation. We thank you that you have not left us to die in our sins, 
You have not left us enslaved to the elementary principles of the world or to our own way of life, but you have made a way for us in Christ to know you, to have a relationship with you, to be given a new life, a new purpose, and a new family. We thank you that in Christ these things are true. We ask that you would help us as a church to rally around that and to love one another fiercely in the way that you have loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with us?
We end every service with a benediction, which is a blessing for the road. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul from 2 Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not in prison. Go out this week as captives of grace to proclaim the liberating news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are sent.